We are joined by Jana Waller, award-winning outdoor host and host of the new show Skullbound Chronicles on Carbon TV. Jana, it is so great to catch up with you. I'm excited to hear what you've been up to and kind of what's on your mind regarding many different subjects. I'm, it's so great to talk to you too. Like I was telling you earlier, you're sort of my go-to for news and uh, anything important politically. <laughs> you're, you're definitely well-versed in that. Uh, myself, I'm too busy. I'm gonna be literally, this has been the joke for a couple of years, but it's becoming uh, into fruition. I'm going to be that old lady living in the mountains with no electricity and 80 dogs. Like that is definitely more my style. I, uh, it's hard to stay in tune. I'd just rather be in the mountains or the woods, but I've got people like you to keep me informed. So it's so nice to chat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not the expert so much. Like I, I try my best to read and I encourage people to do, but if I can be a guide that that's kind of my goal with, with all this stuff in this podcast and this corresponding YouTube video. But for those unfamiliar with your work, can you explain your background, how you got into hunting, how you came to be a TV host and outdoor communicator? I think people really love hearing your journey. Oh, thanks. Well, I was the second daughter. Um, my parents had two daughters. I was the second. I always joke about my dad really wanting a boy, so he turned me into one. And it's a joke, but not really. Um, he just saw really my love of nature and really encouraged that. And so when I was five or six years old, he'd let me take along hunting pheasants in Wisconsin. I grew up in Wisconsin. Um, duck hunting, sitting in the blinds. And then um, he was smart enough to sign me up for hunter safety when I was 12. And we would actually road trip it over to South Dakota and do a lot of pheasant hunting together in my junior high days. And then um, he got into big game hunting deer in Wisconsin when I was in high school. And I was a freshman in college. I went to college at UW Whitewater, just about 10 minutes away from my house. And he called me up one day and he said, I shot my first buck with my bow. Um, do you want to come help me find it? I, I I trailed him last night, left the trail, um, let's go back in. So I went with him and helped him find his buck. And he was just so, I mean, I've never seen my dad more excited. He equates finding that buck to the birth of his two daughters. So wow. I remember thinking, yeah, I want that. I want to know what that feels like. And I bought a bow that year, my freshman year of college. And so it's been almost 30 years um, that I've been archery hunting. And that just led me into all different styles of hunting with all different styles of weapons. I hunt with, I love archery hunting, but I also love long range rifle hunting. I love, I started handgun hunting a few years ago. I've hunted, the only thing I've never hunted with is a crossbow. Um, but it's just, it's been, it's been my whole livelihood, my whole, it's not my whole life career wise. That's only been in the last decade of my life, but it's truly been my number one passion, my whole adult life. And I also think it's the thing that really bonds my father and I. We are really good friends. We always have something to talk about. We always have stories to share. Um, and it's just, it's been a true, true blessing for me. And it's so funny because my sister and I could not be more opposite. The joke is she only goes outside to get to her car. And, <laughs> and uh, but she's an amazing mom of three. And like, she's definitely gone down her own path, completely different than mine. But it's amazing being raised in the same family of, of what a little encouragement can do for your kids in the great outdoors. And most hunters know that truly that's what hunting is all about. It's just appreciating mother nature and being outside. And then there's a lot of other layers to that as well. There's gathering your own food and spending time in the camaraderie with friends and family. And my life has kind of gone a direction where I spend time in the woods and then the mountains with veterans that it's been just incredibly um, soulful to me, really, uh, to hear their stories of combat while we're hunting and healing for both of us, you know, to just get a better appreciation for being a woman living in this amazing country. But yeah, hunting has been basically a part of my entire life. Um, the, I'd say the 30 years of my adult life, um, the first I'd say 18 or 19, would you say? I was in uh, outside sales. I worked for Edward Jones for 10 years, um, kind of doing the corporate world. And then about 11 years ago, um, I, I moved out west of Montana, started my first show, Skullbone TV, that was on the Sportsman's Channel. And that aired for nine years. And then and there's been a kind of big change in my life in the last year and a half. My ex-boyfriend and I broke up. He was my cameraman and my editor. And in trying to decide if I wanted to continue on with the TV show, um, I decided yes, uh, but I wanted to jump into a different platform. I think that um, 
the TV world is just changing a lot right now. And uh, people are cutting their cable cords quite a bit. Um, and so I went to Carbon TV, which is like YouTube for hunters. It's free. It's, it's never going to um, be, you know, it's never going to discriminate like YouTube does on some hunting videos. It's owned by and for the hunters. And so it's, uh, it's been a really great place. My first season of Chronicles was highlights of the past decade of my life with Scope on TV. And this second season is all brand new episodes. That is exciting. Yeah, that you, I, I think I have talked about that with you a little bit offline, how um, there is this kind of shift because I admit I don't watch a lot of the outdoor programming except if it's like on Discovery Channel and some of the other available uh, channels there because I don't have time to consume so much unless if it's like, I know what's in season. Um, I think a lot of young people like myself like to consume stuff online, um, especially if they're new to hunting. I mean, for me, I've been fishing for most of my life, but um, learning about hunting, I've definitely learned through people like yourself, uh, through mentors I've had, and social media has helped too a little bit with trying to navigate certain things. And I think yep. younger people, especially since you're trying your best to reach out to these people who are my age and younger, I think social media and, and these type of consumable channels like Carbon TV could better reach people just because it's more at their fingertips. There's no barrier to access to watch it. You're not uh, tied to cable so much with doing so. And right. it's a good way to communicate. And, and do you, are you going to be chronicling some of your um, international travels once obviously the borders open up uh, to do yeah. so? Also include domestic and international travel? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, yeah, absolutely. So there's an app on your phone, you know, people when they're sitting around during break or in their car waiting for friends or, you know, it's just in the palm of your hand, any 24 seven, you know, that's the beauty of it. And that it's free as well. We all like free. Yeah. And, and I really believe, like you said, this technology world we live in, of course, has pros and cons. You know, everybody's got their head buried in their phone and they've got to make a concerted effort to not do that. Of course. But, right. um, but it is nice to consume, like you said, not for just learning purposes, but you know, sometimes a distraction is what we need from the chaotic world we live in. And I think a lot of hunting and fishing programming is that fun distraction where you can, you know, feel the excitement along with people on their hunt. And some of my episodes are five minutes long, some are 15 minutes long, you know, it just depends. But that quick short formatted, I think is, is really excited. My editor, Heath, um, can just kind of play around and make the story as short or as long as he wants. And uh, it's been a real blessing. Uh, Carbon TV has just been a perfect landing spot for me. And uh, I'm already signed up, going to be there next year. I'll have a, at least one brand new episode every single month. Um, so 12 next year minimum, and then maybe a few more. This year, like I added a make camping great again video because I figured, <laughs> you know, really with, with um, the chaotic world we live in right now with COVID, a lot of people are getting out and experiencing right? camping and hiking and like the great outdoors which if there's one positive thing that can come of this chaos I think it's that yeah. families reconnecting with the great outdoors and there's a lot of little tips and trips tricks that you can make your camping experience so much better I get a lot of messages like that like my girlfriend won't go camping or you know how do I get my kids to actually not be afraid of all the bugs and get outside and there's a lot of little tips and tricks you can do and so I did that video this year that was kind of an extra but um, yeah, there'll be 12 minimum next year. And then I'm thinking of, this will be um, sort of the first time I've actually truly said this, I think on a podcast, but my goal and my intent, and I'm putting it out there into the universe, because I believe that's how it all works. Um, the secret, if you've never seen the secret, you got to go watch the secret. So I'm putting it out there, but I really want season um, four. So not 2021, but 2022, I want to do an all veteran season. Mm -hmm. I want, and, and yeah, feature um, some of the veteran hunts I've done in the past, I've taken, um, five or six, um, amputee veterans and gotten them their first bull elk. I'm actually next week taking Jonathan Blank, former Marine, uh, recon sniper on his first elk hunt in Wyoming. I want to, hunts of the past and then some of that I'll film this year and next year, but then do an all veteran season. That's my goal. That's incredible. That's awesome. I have to probably send some people your way then. I know a few people who may be good recipients of that type yeah. of opportunity. But no, you, you do such great work with that and mm -hmm. taking veterans because that, that's what it is essentially about giving back. And for many of them, spending time outdoors, including hunting is a great way to decompress, excuse me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, just really get away. Is. 
yeah, with PTSD, they say that just the sensory with being outdoors is excellent, like a great remedy. It's not foolproof, but it's much better than, let's say, being stuck on some sort of medicine, medicinal regimen that doesn't work, that perpetuates the problem. And we see studies now actually verifying that uh, kind of evidence that spending time outdoors, whether it's fly fishing or hunting or hiking or horseback riding, whatever, has a lot of therapeutic inherent value for a lot of these men and women who are coming back with the scars of battle. Yeah, it really does. Um, and I can attest to that. I've spent a decade with these amazing men and one woman um, who was a combat medic um, in the field and hearing their stories. And so it's so, it's, it's tenfold. They're getting mother nature. They're soaking it in. It's camaraderie. We're sharing stories. There are also a lot of these, especially uh, amputee veterans are like, oh, I can do this. I can climb this mountain. You know, it's one step at a time. And um, my very first hunt that I ever did was with Bo Richenbeck. And Bo was a, is a double amputee Navy SEAL. He's only one of two above the knee double amputee Navy SEALs in the country. Bo is just a, a beast of a guy too. He's just this like never quit warrior mentality. But took him um, in Montana on an elk hunt. And really that's what spurred all this for me is hearing his stories, watching his just tenacity and his hard work and what that hunt meant to him and his father. And, and so I've tried to do one almost every year since then. And uh, they've all been captured on video and they need to be repurposed. They, I want them to be on carbon so that everybody can see these amazing moments, mm -hmm. hear their stories. What their stories do is not only for them make them feel like I can do this and, and continue on a, a lifetime of hunting, but more so is share their stories of what they've been through and so that we can all connect with that mm -hmm. and understand what an amazing country we do live in. I see a lot of your tweets that I absolutely love talking about your family and your family's heritage, where they came from and coming into this country and the appreciation and People don't, a lot of younger, this younger generations, whether you're in your teens, 20s, 30s, may not have that comparison like mm -hmm. you do. And they don't understand that we live in the most amazing, we are so blessed and so lucky in this country. And I've been really blessed to do a lot of traveling in, in my uh, life. I've been overseas. I've been in the Middle East three times. I understand, I've seen it for my own eyes, what it's like to live in countries that are very oppressive. Right. And uh, yeah, and people don't understand. I love that you are very strong on that stance and you point that out on your Twitter feed a lot. But I want people to hear these combat stories and, and, and hear the atrocities they go through mm -hmm. and having friends die in their arms, uh, losing limbs and life. Um, and to be able to have a better sense of gratitude for this country and our freedoms, which include our guns and our hunting. Absolutely. Yeah, and a brief point on that. Um, people actually don't understand that we have actually the best conservation model system. It's not perfect, but I would say compared to the rest of the world, we're the envy of different countries in Europe and Africa, although their, their models are starting to slowly catch up with ours. And, and they have obviously very different models in place. But my dad would always tell me stories, kind of to your point, that actually like fishing and hunting opportunities were reserved for the elites or for the communists. Uh, basic lay people could not go fishing and hunting. So when people say like, and understandably there's a discussion at large about public versus private land hunting access, and we can go on about that. But um, with both the private and public opportunities we have here, it's actually a lot better. And my dad was always told like, well, uh, the, the free enterprise system in the United States actually destroys nature and wildlife. And he's like, well, since coming here, I've actually seen that theory proven wrong. Um, so yeah, even, even, you know, with kind of going along with the freedom that we have here, I mean, it's imperfect country like anything, but we're better off and better than most of the rest of the world, I would argue. And uh, he's like, yeah, even like wildlife conservation and nature is preserved here pretty well compared to the rest of the world too. And we should be very right. fortunate to have um, not only that, and obviously with the sacrifices that veterans make for us to enjoy these different uh, opportunities to go fishing and hunting, but we, we have a system in place where we should be appreciative of people and we can do this type of stuff. It's not restricted by your age. I mean, unless if you're way, way, way too young, um, obviously, but uh, I mean, it, regardless of your age, it shouldn't be too difficult for you to fish and hunt. You just buy the license as you get older. Um, there's a lot easier access points um, and people are remedying that type of stuff on private land too and even public land. Um, there are obstacles on both. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great system. 
in terms of outdoor opportunities too. And I hope more people discover that maybe they are discovering that um, in these times and organizations yeah, that you work with. I want you to talk briefly about some of the organizations you work with, because not only are you a rock star when it comes to outdoor media, and I hope people do look to you and you are one of the leading ladies, I would argue like Christy Titus, uh, Melissa Bachman, uh, obviously Julie as well, who heads up uh, Carbon TV and she has done a lot of hosting too. So there are some leading ladies like you who've actually really just kind of mastered the art of outdoor storytelling. And a lot of women are looking up to you. And I know with, with your involvement and some of the other ladies involvement, a lot of organizations have tapped you to kind of be a spokesperson, to kind of be this dispenser of different things. So talk about the groups you work with. I think people will be curious to know um, which of the nonprofits and charities have decided to work with you given shared mission statements. Well, thank you for all the kind words. Um, they, I, I work with a lot of them. I'm actually a member of nine of them, but as far as a business relationship, yeah, think about it. You can literally join nine, 10 conservation groups, become a member for less than a dollar a day. I mean, for, you know, we go through, you know, a coffee shop and spend five bucks on a cup of coffee, you know, less than a dollar a day. You can belong to 10 of them if you want. They're usually memberships are around 30, $35. Mm -hmm. And usually that comes with a great magazine. And, um, but just more so than that is feeling like you're a part of things. But I, on a business perspective, um, I work really strongly with the Mule Deer Foundation. I live in Montana. I do a lot of mule deer hunting. Um, I, I see their work in my own, my very own backyard and all the other states that I hunt. Um, but the Mule Deer Foundation, the National Wild Turkey Federation is incredible. There's so much more than just preserving the wild turkeys. I mean, basically they've achieved that goal and now they're really trying hard. Their focus is uh, saving the habitat, save the hunt, saving that public lands for all of us, as well as encouraging the youth to get involved. Um, uh, Sportsman's Alliance is a great group that a lot of people don't understand. There are so many forces that be, if you will, that are trying to take our hunting rights every single day in this country, instating the most ridiculous court cases, but they still get a platform. They get to go before the judge. They get to instate that, you know, amendment, that bill, that whatever, to stop dogs. All dogs from hunting is um, the one that is the most absurd to me in the last couple of years. You know, if anyone owns a hunting dog knows that they live for that. It is in their DNA. It is what they love to do. Um, and not just stopping them uh, for bear and mountain lion hunting, but bird hunting. Um, all kinds of hunting that they wanted to stop dog hunting in. Um, everything from the grizzly bear hunt, like you and I have talked a lot about before, the wolf issue, those are all hunting related issues. Those aren't just about the animals. Um, they're hunting related. They're very political. Uh, they're very emotional, not science-based. Um, but we need groups that are going to go into that courtroom and fight for us. And one of the main groups that does that is the Sportsman's Alliance. Um, but they're, they're all great. The Rocky Mountain Elf Foundation, uh, Safari Club International, uh, Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife, they're a great organization. Um, there's so many good ones. Get involved, not just by becoming a member, but one way that I've given back in the last 25 years, I believe, is with my artwork. Um, we might want to say that. People, uh, I always think it's funny if people hear who I, oh, she has a show called Skullbound TV or Skullbound Chronicles, and they think Skullbound, like the girl goes hunting skulls, like how weird is that? I'm, a, <laughs> I'm actually a skull artist. I paint and I bead skulls. Everything from antelope, deer, bear, coyote, to longhorn, buffalo, you name it, I've probably beaded it and, uh, and painted it. And I donate a lot of them to the conservation groups because it's really fun. It's a fun way to donate back to what I believe in, and that's these groups that do the best job at protecting our hunting heritage and it goes, it's so multifaceted, like you know, but basically protecting what I love. And that's my hunting rights, my public land rights, and protecting our species when they need it. Um, there's such a disconnect. I got to talk about that for a second. There's such a disconnect for people who have not grown up in a hunting family or don't have any interaction with hunters that we're the ones who actually pay for the majority of wildlife management in this country. And that goes everything from, for example, um, they reinstated a herd here of wild sheep on the mountain. I'm in Utah, actually, this week on a mule deer hunt, doing office work today, unfortunately, but that's okay. My legs needed a break. Um, <laughs> but like, so wild sheep often get pneumonia. They can contract pneumonia often from domesticated sheep. And if that wild sheep herd dies off, and everyone knows that, well, most people know that wild sheep, it's an incredible hunt. 
it's a big dollar generator for the conservation groups, um, also for the states. And if that herd dies off, it's typically hunter's dollars that are replacing that herd. And it's very cost costly to replace that herd. Um, the studies that are going on, I live in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana, and we have a lot of mountain lion. And there's a lot of studies that have gone on. In fact, you can look it up on the fishing game website for Montana, a lot of mountain lion studies and how mountain lion affect the elk and the deer herds. And uh, they uh, there was a big three-year study not too long ago. You can read all about it on their site. And they came to the conclusion that we have way too many mountain lion. Like the carrying capacity of the land, they're way overpopulated and it's an over-the-counter tag. And so tag, I get made fun of, you can hear that Wisconsin accent. I love it. It's great. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, but, you know, those science-based those science -based studies are often funded because of our hunter dollars, whether it's the licenses we purchase, the tags we buy, um, the conservation permits, the, um, the uh, Pittman-Robertson Act, the tax, uh, our guns, our ammunition, our archery products, they're taxed. When we buy those products, that tax is, that goes to the states to manage their wildlife. Again, hunter-based. A lot of people don't, there's that disconnect there. Right. But um, yeah, the conservation groups that I work with, I, it's just one, another thing I'm, I'm really proud of. I've raised um, over $70,000 with my artwork in the last 20 years. And uh, just, and, and mind you, this is not like, this is not professional art. This is just my skull stuff that I love to do that's super fun. And oh, it builds up. And, mm -hmm. you know, I try to encourage people to not only get involved in a local conservation group chapter, the banquets are so much fun. You can win great hunts. There's often lots of uh, guns and archery products you can win. There's jewelry, furs, you name it. It's so much fun. But give back if you can. I don't care if you're, you make your own bracelets and jewelry. I don't care if you, you know, make your own artwork or I've had people who are really into leather making and they've donated vests and knife sheaths and, you know, cool stuff like that, that, that you can go to these banquets and bid on and to just get involved feels so good to give back. Yeah, it, it really does. And because of your different contributions and your efforts, uh, you have actually had some recent opportunities, I would say in the last few years, and, and I would say for the other, uh, for advocacy, something this year, uh, a lot of people want to seek out your opinion and your involvement. And you are, I believe, are an alternate. I, I think I was the one who recommended you to be the alternate on the Council yeah. for Hunting and Shooting Sports for the Interior Department. Yeah. And then um, you also have kind of taken the plunge kind of more openly to support the president's reelection bid as part of his Sportsman for Trump coalition. Could you speak to both of those uh, involvement? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's an honor. I'm on the advisory board for the Sportsman for Trump Council and um, total honor. I, I, I think it's safe to say that I have never used my social media platform for anything really other than hunting and conservation messages. Um, but I just felt like about a year ago to make a stance. I feel like this important, this election is obviously the most important of our lifetime, of my lifetime, definitely. I feel like our culture is changing and shifting. The, the idea of anyone being anti-hunting even 30 years ago was ridiculous. Um, you know, it was never thought of as something negative. And it's often portrayed in mainstream media as very negative, that we're all a bunch of hillbillies chewing our tobacco, shooting from the pickup truck, chugging a beer, you know, and a lot of mainstream movies um, portray that. Uh, social media is not kind to hunters at all. Um, we get banned and blocked. I've, I've had timeouts on Facebook <laughs> with like, for example, my last one was uh, a big bear a couple years ago that I shot in Montana. Bear hunting is like, you know, um, part of the whole wildlife management system. If we don't manage our predators, then the ungulates suffer. I posted a picture of a bear I shot in Montana and got a time out. You know, that's, that to me is so discretionary. That is so uh, stereotyping hunters as, as something that we're doing something criminal or negative or, you know, I've often tried to promote uh, some of the companies I work for. I work for like my, probably the biggest company that I work for is Nasler for their ammunition and their rifles. Sometimes I've tried to do a post about them and have gotten my post denied that I can't put a little money behind it because I want to advertise maybe a new round that just came out or their carbon fiber rifle. And then I can't even do that. Um, it's, it's sad to me. 
And so about a year ago, I just decided that I'm not going to go over the top, but I need, I feel like if you don't stand tall, you're going to fall for anything. And I wanted to stand tall. I believe that Trump is the best answer for this. The, the, the times that we're in right now, he's not a perfect man. None of us are. And I believe that if you took, if you dissected all of the policies and all of the principles that uh, Biden versus Trump and laid them all out, we sportsmen, we hunters, we gun lovers um, need to get back up and need to get behind Trump. The probably the turning point for me was when I had heard the statistic of how um, hunters and anglers, how we are in the field so much in November that we typically as a whole and as a group do not get out and vote. And that in and of itself is scary to me. We can't sit on the sidelines anymore. Not just for, there's so many topics we can discover, but we can discuss, but the gun issue, for example, I am a woman, I live alone in Montana and well, not right now. I have a most awesome roommate, Laura Zara, but yeah, we are both, you know, both women, we live alone. It is my right. If I want a gun in every room of my house, which I have, um, it's my right. If I want to conceal a gun in my purse or in my truck, it's my right. I have a right to protect myself. I also have a right to protect myself, not just against the four-legged predators in the mountains, which I face all the time. You and I have talked about the grizzly issue a lot, um, but the two-legged kind that are, you know, lurking around often dark corners. I, as horrible as these riots have been, I hope it's made, well, I know it's made people, look at the gun sales, made people realize that they have a right to defend their home, their loved ones, their private property. And that issue in and of itself, we know that the Trump administration is so much stronger on. And then there's tons of others that we could talk about. We could be here for the next 12 hours. But I just felt it was time to stand tall and strong. Um, we have weekly uh, call sessions right now, the advisory board does, of how we can reach people better through our social media, through, uh, you know, talking to people in the grocery store or, you know, people. On my social media, I'm from Wisconsin. I've got some people on my Facebook that <laughs> may not be exactly along the same lines I'm at, but I, but I want to discuss that. I, I don't, I don't want to come across heavy handed. I want to discuss, well, if you're not voting for Trump, why in the, why are you voting? Like, and, and who are you voting for and why? Let's discuss this. You know, I think that we see on social media right now, people are, people often are um, spewing out their points of view without having some adult conversation. And that's absolutely not what I'm trying to do, but I'm trying to say what I'm standing tall for. And that's definitely four more years of Trump. How, how have, let's say the outreach efforts been, because I know there are certain different efforts. There's like hunt the vote, which is not directly tied, but they're largely affiliated. A lot of their members are but how, how have been the efforts to get hunters to vote? Because I've heard this too. I've heard in the different Rust Belt states that there are so many different hunters who, obviously, because hunting season conflicts with election day oftentimes, but this year now people have early option to vote in person, uh, yeah. absentee or early voting in person, uh, which I think a lot of hunters will take advantage of, um, one way, whatever, yeah. however they vote. But I keep hearing that, yeah, we're not reaching out to the hunters. I, I think this is true here in Virginia and Rust Belt states, um, even in Montana, probably Wyoming, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania. But how have the efforts been? H has the reception been pretty good to people to respond to the president's reelection campaign? Or do you see some people? Because I know there are some hunters who certainly will go for Biden just because they are not just single issue voters. They're definitely more to the left on other issues, too. But would you say from what you can gauge so far, do you think that hunters are more open to four years of this uh, presidency and administration or it's divided? 100%. But mind you, I've also, my world is the West. So sure. in the last, you know, six weeks, I've been in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah. And so, um, for example, yesterday we were in the mountains and there were, where I'm hunting, I'm hunting the Wasatch Range here in Utah, and it's a lot, it's like the, I thought Wisconsin was bad with the Orange Army, but it was orange everywhere, right? It's public land. People, there are just hundreds and th thousands of people out hunting the same mountain range I am. It was awesome because so many of the people who are camping up in the mountains were flying their Trump flags. And I, I yeah, like, oh, <laughs> like they literally put either flying the American flag, and most of them were doubled with the American flag and their Trump flag. And uh, it was fantastic to see. I actually even pulled in, 
John and I, my boyfriend, we pulled into one campsite that was like two huge Trump flags. And there was probably like, looked like four big campers there and all the kids and running around. And I pulled in there and I had a stack of sportsmen for Trump decals in my truck like this thick. And I handed out decals. I just said, it's so nice to see your flags. I'm on the advisory board for Trump. And, would, and you guys like decals? And oh, yeah, yeah. And we just, it is definitely, I would say, among the groups that I've been talking to, the sportsmen and women of the West, it is, it's exciting to see. It's very pro-Trump. The people are excited. You know, my question was, is everybody going to get out and vote? You know, yeah, we all are. And, you know, it's been great. It's been absolutely great. I have literally been in those four states in the last six weeks, and I have seen one Biden sign. One. And I've been looking, hardcore looking, and I have seen thousands of Trump flags and signs. So I would say that in, but this is my world. I mean, I'm, we have to admit that this is the hunter. A handful of them out here, although it's more divided, actually, even in like farming country and hunting country. I'll see both Biden and Trump signs um, because I know in Virginia it's kind of more divided along those lines, but um, certainly more than I expected in terms of Trump signs. And I think um, the hunting populace here, I think, is probably evenly divided, maybe a little tilting more towards the president and his reelection efforts. But yeah, I think um, certainly because like out west, you hear like a lot of people are more liberal in the hunting community because they do public land hunting. So that's interesting that that's kind of what you've seen. Um, there are groups like that. There definitely yeah. are groups like that. Um, I still feel though, like if they, if they tore apart the issues back and forth right. that are hunting related or public land related, I think, I feel so strongly that the Trump administration is definitely, if that's, if that's how, one of their deciding factors are they really need to look at what Trump has done in the last four years. Mm -hmm. um, they need to look at the fact that, you know, Junior, Don Jr., who I've seen twice in the last six weeks, he, he is one of the biggest hunters I've ever met. I mean, he's hardcore hunting. His, his, so their family is. And they understand the importance of it, too. The uh, importance of wildlife management, importance of getting your kids into the great outdoors, of hunting and fishing. And I, th I think that... Um, Definitely what I've seen is a stronger Trump um, by far. But again, this is my little world out here that we're living in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in the social media world, it's hard to gauge as well because my friends and followers tend to be along the same lines I am. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that's what our bubbles are, you know. Um, but I, I'm happy to report that my bubble here in the West is definitely pro-Trump. <laughs> Yeah, I have seen the division a little bit in the sporting community. Um, I would say it does lean more, like anecdotally, I can tell that it does lean more towards him. Like a lot of people are more shy about it. Like, I mean, I'm I'm certainly inclining myself that way, voting that way, but I don't talk about it so much because I don't need to tell my opinion. Like, even though I'm right. like a called thought leader, like people can surmise, like that's kind of leaning how, that's how I'm leaning. But um, I can respect people who vote for Biden, like even if I disagree. Uh, and I know a lot of people in the sporting community will, and that's just with anything because they they feel strongly about his positions and hey they are within their right to um i'm not gonna i think our side is a little better where we can respect the other side you know voting for a certain way and i don't think this division should really uh divide the sporting community <laughs> any more than it already is divided uh, but I, yeah. I know everyone's gonna have different opinions in terms of who they're voting for and when i did the assessment between the two candidates i actually found that actually biden borrowed a lot of what president trump is doing and to me, as a reporter, I'm like, why is this not being covered more? Like that he's borrowing a lot of the topics. Um, certainly Trump was a little late to deciding his support for the Great American Outdoors Act. He had, uh, he nixed it from the budget, but he consulted some of the Republicans and they told him, no, sir, you need to like fund this. And be like, well, yeah. he didn't support it first. And I'm like, well, that's part of negotiations, budget negotiations. Right. Like he didn't understand the importance of it. And he had his people tell him, and I gave him a little slack for that because I was like, that happens all the time. Like, I bet you under Obama's administration, I, I recall many instances where he probably nixed certain things in the environment and conservation related issues and then included it or nixed it all together, whatever. So you have to give a little deference to the president uh, because there are a lot of issues that happen. It's not that the, this issue wasn't important, but now he can say like, I have signed into law the most consequential public lands outdoor bill 
in 50 years of any president. So people who, who say that he was maybe a little late to the game, like should give him credit for getting bipartisan support to get that issue across the line. And I think you will see sportsmen even reluctantly supporting him because he has done a lot to expand access. He's done a lot with wildlife corridors, with improving the environment um, in Florida and Lake Okeechobee regions in the Great Lakes region, he's continuing to fund that. So I think people, if they read between the lines, they'll see that. And certainly they, they may be like, well, that's not enough proof for me to vote for him. And that's perfectly fine. Like we're a, a constitutional republic. Everyone has different views. But yeah, I do see kind of the sportsman community gravitating a little bit more so towards the president just because they like their guns. I don't see how gun control is a issue this year because of all these different instances. And you see un un unorthodox or untraditional demographics, a lot of black Americans, women, Hispanic, Asian Americans, all are buying guns in droves. It's not your typical cookie cutter gun voter. It's, right. and even liberals too are shown to be uh, buying guns in, in mass a bit more. So it's, it's not your conventional gun owner. Everyone wants to protect themselves. So that could largely go into, it'll be interesting to see exit polling. I mean, it'll be interesting yeah. to see if people can document how hunter behavior and voting patterns happen. The only thing I've seen was from the National Wildlife Federation from like eight years ago that said like majority of hunters and anglers tend to vote Republican, tend to be conservative, it was like 50% and then like uh, 30 something percent for independent and like 20 something for Democrats. So it's, it's an interesting breakdown, but I wonder if those numbers have changed uh, since people have started to kind of join the ranks. But I would love to see more polling and, and attitude uh, documentation of that, but but it is a traditionally more Republican conservative thing. But everyone is welcome to be a part of it. That's what I always say. Yeah, I, and I I love I love what you said about the respect. I think it's so important. I don't I do see a lot of disrespect coming from the left. Right. Um, a, a liberals often very disrespectful on social media. Um, at the same time, you talk about polling, and it's it's funny because. I just watched The Social Dilemma. Have you watched that? I haven't ever told me I need to watch it. <laughs> I don't believe anything I read anymore. <laughs> it's insane. Like, it's truly insane. And I know, and I believe it. I believe the documentary in what it says. And that is that not just social media, not just Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, Google. Google can, when if you type in, like the example they use on the documentary is, is climate change real or you know you know de describe climate change depending on your geographic location you're going to get a different answer google it's so interesting and it you know i just i don't believe half of what i used to believe what i used to read even a, a year ago and and now with the media being clearly not what the media used to be Gone are the days of having just a flat out news channel that you could go and watch the news, you know, and I don't have basic TV either. Um, I've had Sling for a couple of years, which is like 30 channels, you know, but I have Roku, by the way, for those wondering how to watch carbon TV, if you have a fire stick or Roku, you can just put it right there on your menu because I'm, I'm old school. I still like to watch my hunting on a TV, uh, like late at night, right before I go to bed kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. I encourage you to watch that because you'll now wonder like about stuff that shows up in your feed and why it's showing up in your feed and even like Googling stuff, like you could get one answer depending on where you are in the country and what it profiles you and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know there are some people that still have a moral sense because everyone in the documentary is tough. They're, they were big wigs at Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or even, um, Pinterest, um, that it's really interesting. These are guys who were heads of these companies and they're the ones coming out and saying, we have a moral obligation to our society. The suicide rate in preteens is skyrocketed. You know, teens and 20 year olds have complexes. Like morally, it's just not right what we're doing. It needs to be regulated in some form or fashion, just like the, like, telecom industry is regulated. Your People who own your phones know everything about you, but it's regulated. They can't just sell off all your information. It's fascinating. So every time I hear about polls lately and every, because I just watched it last week, I don't know what to believe anymore. It, it, I, I believe that we all sort of need to do our research a little bit better and look into topics. Um, you, I know that you, you don't have to, you, I go to you for advice. Um, you probably do your research way more than most, but it's, 
it's fascinating this world we live in today how we get our news from online and that news is often slanted and it it didn't used to be like that right reporters their oath was to report the news and try not to make it commentary try not to add opinion try and gone are those days i believe yeah and that's why for one in terms of an antidote to this social media dilemma people should go outdoors and two, yeah. people should support the work of individuals like myself who can cover the outdoor beat, the gun beat, pretty fair. I mean, certainly I have biases, of course, but I try to like take the other side into account, insert their opinion, and I acknowledge my bias. Like if, if people just would acknowledge it a little better, then you can understand kind of the nuance behind it. But that's mm -hmm. why it's so important for outdoor writers and communicators to sound off on social media about these issues, about our issues with hunting, fishing, and shooting sports kind of tell the story. And that's why people like you come in very well for this and uh, we can I can supplement my efforts by leaning on you and I've leaned on you for different bear issues, wolf issues, all that type of stuff because you're a repository of information. And yeah, I think if people were just more adamant, um, obviously, and I hope the I've, I've talked to people at certain tech companies and some of them are open and do want to work and I tell them like, why don't you guys have like an outreach person for outdoors because there's a huge media share of people who do fishing, hunting, shooting sports, who use your products. And they don't necessarily have someone to respond to like censorship so much. A lot of it is automation. Mm -hmm. And certainly I can't yeah. fault them for that. Like it's a big conglomerate, so it's very hard, but I hope I've told them like, and I've expressed my like desire to them to be like, Hey, you guys should like either learn how to like approach these issues better. Um, I can help you. Like there are many of us who can help you so you can help correct problems. Uh, make it a little easier, uh, more possible for people who want to fish and hunt to use the platforms, educate people. And I think when they're presented with different material, they're like, oops, yeah, we shouldn't have like censored this. And believe it or not, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, he's actually a bow hunter. I <laughs> learned about this a few years ago and I was like, this is so unique. So maybe if he were uh, a little, maybe he was more involved in the dialogue and I understand he's very top chain of command and he has people who he de uh, delegates to not excusing a lot of the stuff, you know, the suppressing of different things. But I think they could be open to hearing from hunters. I hope they do set that dialogue uh, because they know people who hunt use their websites, like all the different companies and brands, you use it uh, very well. Like there are a lot of people who would want to use the platform or going to rejoin the platform if they knew that they, they don't need a safe space, but if they knew that they could comfortably and safely use the platform and not get ostracized or silenced or something of that nature. Right, 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 right. Yeah, the censorship is crazy. Uh, it really is. Like, I've seen it myself. Uh, I've seen it this week alone with the hot, you know, Hunter Biden topics right. going on. And my friends, Dana Lash, she got a timeout. Yeah, our friend Dana, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, who, else, who else did I see get sent? Well, Junior has been talking a lot about that lately. But um, yeah, it's for it's real. The, censor, the censorship is real. And we live in a country that it's shocking to me that we can't, that freedom of speech doesn't exist right now. And uh, that's really scary, in my opinion. And that's another reason why I decided to be on the advisory, the Sportsman's for Trump Advisory Board, is I just feel like I can't sit in the sidelines anymore and watch it go down without standing tall and in and, uh, and what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad to have podcasts are such an amazing thing. I do tons of traveling and I listen to so many podcasts, but it's so great having you out there with your voice and the fact that you're a little bit newer to the hunting world, you've been fishing right. your whole life, but that is such a great perspective because the people don't even know where to start. And you've talked no. a lot about that and I love it. Um, if more people understood what hunting truly is about and that it, it's about filling your freezer and being in mother nature and getting outside and exploring, oh my gosh, it's, I, I, you know, scouting is the same thing as exploring, if you ask me. If you're like trying to figure out where the big game are or what the flyways for the birds are or whatever it's all it's just diving into what is real that's what i've had conversations with people who don't hunt often like sitting on an airplane next to someone and you're stuck there for three hours in fact this is really interesting one of the best conversations i ever had was with an african-american from inner city chicago who was a professor at mcgill university we sat down on a plane and i i can't even remember what flight it was and a really great guy and he said so what do you do for a living and i said i host a hunting television show and he his first thing out of his mouth was well 
oh my gosh, you're not one of those NRA freaks, are you? And I said, actually I am. And we had the most amazing conversation because like you said earlier, we're both open-minded. We both respected each other. His perspective is one that I haven't really thought of all that much. And that is he grew up in inner city Chicago. Guns are bad. Guns kill people, period. Like that's it. And I started to talk about how I gun hunt with a handgun, with a long range rifle, with you name, muzzle or you name it, shotgun. And what hunting has done for my life and how it's bonded my family and my friends, what it's done for the veterans that I've taken out, what it would do to inner city kids if they could go through a hunter safety program. And we, I got a long email the next day. It's the only one I've ever gotten from an aunt. By the way, he was a vegan too. It's the, yeah. It's the only email I've ever gotten from a anti-hunter vegan that was like, you ha the, the email was a very nice message and it said, I just have to tell you, you have my wheels spinning from our conversation yesterday. Perspectives that I haven't really thought about. And I think that it came from a woman was different that, you know, than if some big guy was telling him how great it is to hunt, you know, to, to, you know I think, let's face it, like you said, let's, let's be honest, when you hear or see a woman and you know she's sitting there with a big elk or a bear and it's like yeah you did that yourself on public land that's so amazing oh my gosh how do you, what, what you know it can blow it can really open up people's minds to really listen about well how'd you get into that what do you know well i'm filling my freezer and i'm doing all these things and i'm part of wildlife management and on and on and on but but that was the one conversation of from an anti that was a positive because we respected one another and we really listened to, I understood where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think he understood how guns could be good and guns could be a wonderful, a wonderful component to your life, not just for protection, but for gathering food and, mm -hmm. and having fun. And, you know, there's a lot of high schools right now that are getting into trap shooting and, you know, shooting sports in high school. And I think that's awesome. And anyway, it, it, we are, again, we're in our own little bubbles. And we've got to remember that to reach anybody who's outside of our bubble, we have to show them respect. We've got to show them the passion. And we have to show them the good that's coming out of what we do. And we already know the good that hunt comes from hunting because of the conservation model of the United States. But we've got to express that better. They can't just turn on what was that movie? Oh, Wolverine, I think is the movie where it opens up in the beginning and there's some guy drinking a beer shooting from his pickup truck. You know, that's what they see. You know, that's, that's what a hunter is. And no, that's not what we are. And we've got to open up that dialogue. Yeah. And that's why like different projects like Blood Origins, which you were featured in, I have yet to meet Robbie, but I have interviewed him on several occasions. He's has a really cool project. I saw they just became a nonprofit. So that's where projects like his can come in. Um, yeah. I think all the different, like certain like beer companies are even partnering with uh, outdoor enthusiasts, hunters and anglers to tell the stories of this. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like people are like, Ooh, I'm so intrigued by like the hunting mystique and yeah. about this and, and the conservation principle. So we, we are starting, I think, to slowly make a way in that. And I, I have a new friend who is a vegetarian, but he's an avid fly angler. And he's like, I don't hate hunters. I just, on principle, I just don't like eating meat, but I can totally respect someone who goes hunting. And he's super chill. He's like, I hate all politicians. So I'm like, we can get along fine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he, that, like, he, he understands and is like, yeah, I totally get it. I understand how it contributes to conservation. But, you know, sometimes, like you said, we can all fall into our different bubbles, but like, I've always been keen on like having a different types of friends, people who don't think exactly yeah. like me. And maybe because I grew up in yeah. California, I was always exposed to different views and I had to challenge my views living up, yeah. living there. But, and even here in the DC metro area, but it's like, I think the media, a lot of my media colleagues sadly distort how actually people can come together, have, you know, nice uh, dialogue. It could be heated at times, but they can have dialogue civilly like adults and maybe come to different conclusions, but still kind of hash out different details and come away with it from respect. Uh, more so than they want it to be, because I think the media does make money. A lot of people talking heads make money through discord and uh, disarray yep. and, and they don't care about dialogue. They're just like, just read a headline and that's it. Like there's nothing beyond the headline. Oh, look at like Cecil the lion. That yeah. in itself is the most perfect example. Like talk about, you know, just a storm that went across this country and other, actually the world and people weren't, they didn't know the story. They didn't know the details. They don't understand 
the conservation aspect of hunting in Africa and what it does for, there are, there are no poaching patrols without hunting. Like the, the, and we can, that could be a whole podcast in and of itself. Robbie does a really good job out on Blood Origins. Uh, people need to go follow Blood Origins social media account and also watch the shows on Amazon Prime. Everybody's got Amazon Prime these days. Um, because it is, it is a better told story of why we hunt and why the world needs hunting in terms of conservation. And, uh, but yeah, that, the, the Cecil the Lion, um, I've been corrupted. I've been saying Cecil this whole time. Apparently it's Cecil. Um, <laughs> but that, the story in and of itself is such a perfect example of mainstream media blowing it up and people not understanding the true facts behind it. And, uh, and that happens a lot, even in our country, about specific styles of hunting. And uh, we need to tell our story better. We knew. And I think, I think it's moving in there. If, and the one thing um, you clicked on in my brain of saying, like, the craziness that we live in right now, 2020, this COVID craziness, if there is one thing, maybe two, that have come out of it that are real positives, is that reconnection to nature, like we talked about with people getting out and hunting, and I mean camping, sorry, that's two topics. Camping, getting out into the great outdoors with their kids, and like, because there wasn't anything else to really do, right? We couldn't take, go to the movies, go to the mall, whatever. And also hunting. People went to the grocery store for the first time, maybe in their lifetimes, and saw empty shelves because of COVID. And uh, I think it's really opened up some people's eyes. I've talked to people who have never really considered the benefits that we hunters sat back and are like, man, my freezer's full. You know, in my freezer right now, I've got elk, antelope, mule deer, whitetail, pheasants, trout, mountain lion, bear, you name it, I'm stocked. I could probably live out of my freezer for another year and a half. Um, and that concept is new to people because of COVID. And so if there's anything positive that can come up across all this chaos, it's that people maybe at least opening up their minds and understanding the hunter perspective a little bit better and the food gathering benefit of hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are seeing a little bit of a transformative effect on that. And uh, we'll see if public opinion on hunting starts to increase, but I, I'm really curious to see how much the numbers in terms of participation will rise because a, a lot of initial data that's coming out shows it's actually very good for us and for the industry at large. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And uh, I've talked to a lot of people and there's certain aspects of it that are in play there too. Um, like the mentorship program that's now, and I don't, you would know better than I do how many states they passed the mentorship program where you don't, if you are, if you are with a mentor, you don't have to go through hunter safety first. Um, and it, every state's a little bit different on the age. Some it's 10 for big game, others like Texas, there is no age, you know, uh, restrictions, but the mentorship program is a great thing in terms of getting new hunters out in the field. And that's the one thing I've always told people who, who've never been before, but are curious about it. Go, go along with a hunter, ask flat out, ask for the order, ask if you can go along and take along. You don't have to carry a weapon your first season out, see what it's about, shadow somebody, whether it's in a duck blind or in the woods, deer hunting, shadow them, see what it's like, watch nature come alive around you. Um, you know, and just experience it like that before you dive in and, and buy a license or you don't have to, don't ever, I always tell hunters who are trying to, how do I get my wife or girlfriend or kids involved? Don't throw a weapon in their hands right away. Let them come with you and shadow you and get comfortable and see what it's like. Then maybe go to the range, have them shoot your weapons, teach them about safety, have them sign up for hunter safety. The educational, I think hunter safety ought to be a given in every school in this country. You know, learning about wildlife management, learning gun safety, and but um, yeah, it's all fascinating. But I do believe that uh, well, we need to have it make it. We need it to change. We need licenses purchased. It's been on a decline. You know, all of our great and grandfathers and great grandfathers, uh, they all used to hunt. It used to just be a part of living. You know, and as those generations are dying off, we're not replacing buying new licenses. You know fast enough. And so I think we're down to less than, I think, 5% of the population purchases hunting licenses. And that's pretty scary. That's low. It used to be 10%. It used to kind of be where it was easy to talk about even like a decade ago, because you'd think of 10% of us are hunters. We purchase license. 10% are 
anti, vehemently anti hunting. And then there's the 80 percenters. And we need, those are the ones we really need to reach. That anti is never going to tell me, I'm, talk me into becoming an anti. And I'm probably not going to talk them into becoming a hunter. But that 80% that are sort of indifferent, that don't really understand what hunting's all about, they maybe don't have any hunter friends or didn't grow up in a hunter family. That's the, those are the people we need to reach. And even if, like your friend, even if he doesn't want to go hunting and he doesn't really want to eat meat, as long as he understands the importance oh, and when it comes down to voting, yeah, understand and gets it, gets the importance of it, that's what we need. We need people to understand that the importance of it, even if they're not going to buy licenses, is to support it when it comes to issues, local state issues of supporting and what it means to have hunting in their state. Amen. No, this has all been so wonderful. We've covered the gamut of like politics and wildlife conservation. And I know we could talk at length about this. And I hope once COVID subsides, we can do that women's trip I was telling you about to my yeah. clients. Uh, lodge down in Georgia. He would, he loved meeting you and he's like, Jana talked about great things and it would be so good to have her and Christy and Katie Pavlich and everyone come to the lodge. And I'm like, absolutely. We'll make it happen. Hopefully once all this craziness subsides and I hope yeah. I get to see you at some point very soon, maybe even beforehand. Um, but how can people connect with you, follow the show, get involved, um, learn about the different organizations you'd mentioned. So list off where people can find you in the show. Um, they can watch Skullbone Chronicles on carbontv.com. It's free. They can Google it right online. They can watch it on the Carbon TV app. If they have a Roku or Fire Stick, they can watch it on their TV. Um, they can also watch all previous episodes of Skullbone TV on motv.com. Those are still up there, like nine seasons worth, I believe. Um, all new seasons, though, are going to be on Carbon TV. They can also find me on social media. I do a pretty good job of posting, try to post every day. Um, it's Skullbound TV for Facebook. It's Skullbound, no, yes, no. I just did a change, which <laughs> Skullbound Chronicles is now the show I'm working on now. And I used, um, there's only one Facebook page. It's Skullbound Chronicles. And on Instagram, I went and bought the, or got the Skullbound Chronicles site, but it got to be too confusing posting back and forth. So I, if you go there, there's just a big post from like two months ago that says, go to Skullbound TV. Right. On Instagram. Your verified account. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. Yep. So Skullbone TV on Instagram, Skullbone Chronicles on Facebook, um, on Twitter, it's Skullbone TV. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm much better at, at Instagram than I am at Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's funny because again, uh, with that censorship, I feel like Facebook's a bit more censoring of my stuff than Instagram is. I don't know why. The same parent but company. They're, they're one of the same. I yeah, I know. But yet I, as far as like boosting ads for my partners and such. Yeah. I don't know why I have better luck on Instagram and I have a better reach on Instagram, even though I have half the following. So oh. who knows, oh. but it's weird. That is really odd. But no, just when I, I think I have the social media world figured out, I, I, I then find out I don't. So. <laughs> and I analyze social media stuff too, and, and it's ever changing. So it, I've been lost on certain things myself, but you have a great social media presence. Like I always love seeing your posts. I always message you like, oh my gosh, you have such a great like harvest. Or I try to reshare stories with uh, my kind of smaller following on Instagram, but that's okay. Uh, but like, I try to share your content too. And you really do have like a positive uh, bent to your following and, and, and to your presence. So I always tell people like you have to follow Jana if you want to learn, if you want to see a woman doing it all in the hunting industry, she's the perfect person. And well, uh, no, I, I encourage our listeners and watchers to check you out on those and to connect with you. And I hope we get to have more conversations like this in person to catch up. And uh, you keep us abreast with all your different things with the show, your involvement with the coalition group, uh, with the advisory board on Department of Interior. And I thank you so much for speaking with me. And it's so great to be your friend and, and to, to catch up with you and, and to have you sound off on these important issues. Well, thank you so much for all the kind words. You're too sweet. And thank you for like being my person I go to for needing political advice or seeing what's on the, what's trending, what's not, whatever. You're way more in touch with the world than I am. So uh, we make a good friendship. Thank you so much. And I look forward to our next chat.